Well, welcome to Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, which is a product of uh, politics uh, in motion. Today I want to uh, do a sort of wide-ranging search uh, in and around the question of international relations, uh, because this now seems to be something that is coming to the forefront of where the world is at. Now, I've always been interested, for some reason or other, in the uh, settlement that ended World War I, which was the uh, Versailles uh, Treaty. And uh, I was interested initially for a couple of reasons that had to do with the fact that uh, that treaty withdrew, withdrew uh, the boundaries of many new European states, uh, did so globally, it dealt with, uh, if you like, the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire and the disintegration of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire and uh, also the whole kind of question of uh, the colonial legacy and Germany's role in that uh, legacy. Uh, and all of that, uh, certain cartographic uh, requirements existed and those were provided by the American Geographical Society that was headed up at that time by a man called Isaiah Bowman. Now, Isaiah Bowman was uh, a very well-known geographer and advisor to various administrations. And at a certain point, he became president of Johns Hopkins University, where he set up a geography program in which I ultimately taught. It was that program that uh, hired uh, Owen Lattimore, uh, which I mentioned in a much earlier podcast. So there is, if you like, a bit of geographical history that goes into uh, all of this. But I'm now actually more concerned with uh, the content of the Versailles settlement and some of the things that uh, were going around uh, at that time. Now, the Versailles settlement was essentially a negotiation between four major figures uh, from the United States, Woodrow Wilson, from Britain, uh, Lloyd George, from France, Georges Jean Clemenceau, and from Italy, a man called Orlando, who played not very much of a role. Now, the, the anticipation would be that uh, Woodrow Wilson would have called the shots because uh, it was the weight of uh, the mass of the US economy and the US engagement at the end of the war, which finally uh, ended the war, so he had, if you like, all of the moral authority and the economic clout. But it seems that he didn't perform terribly well. Uh, there are various reasons for this. Some people think that he had a, a dose of uh, the 1980 Spani 1918 Spanish flu, uh, which uh, debilitated him some. But the other reason is that uh, the French uh, prime minister at that time, Clemenceau, was a very persuasive and very uh, sophisticated negotiator and apparently ran rings around Woodrow Wilson. And uh, Clemenceau, however, was what you might call a sort of social Darwinist. And uh, as a social Darwinist, uh, he saw states as perpetual institutions, always in competition and fighting with each other. And the, fire, the survival of the, rit rit uh, of the fittest was very much uh, upon his agenda. And he was going to use the Versailles uh, Treaty as a way of reestablishing France's authority. Um, one of the things that he did was to insist upon regaining the two uh, provinces of France, Alsace-Lorraine, which uh, France had ceded to the Germans in the fight of uh, 1870. So this was a very, very tense thing in which a lot of the negotiation was over borders and who had the right to what and all the rest of it. The English delegation was somewhat at one side. 
But within the English delegation was one particular person, a very bright and up-and-coming economist, who was delegated to the Treasury for the per period of the Versailles Conference. And that uh, uh, person was John Maynard Keynes. Uh, now, Keynes was therefore there at the negotiation, but about three quarters of the way through, he fell sick. And so he uh, actually returned to Cambridge, which was his base, and uh, saw the conclusion of the treaty from afar. And Keynes was quite outraged by what was going on in terms of the, this, uh, this treaty. Uh, from Keynes' viewpoint, uh, the, the, the most important thing was to re-establish a vibrant economic system for Europe. And what Keynes saw was a debilitated uh, Germany, a, a, a heavily indebted and destroyed France, and that therefore needed to be a kind of a, a, a serious attempt made to re-establish uh, the capitalist forms of economics that uh, Keynes was in favour of. And I've often mentioned Keynes as a figure who, who, who wanted to save uh, capitalism from the capitalists. In this case, Keynes wanted to save capital uh, from the nationalists and people like uh, Clemenceau who sought simply national advantage out of the whole thing rather than the uh, revival of the economy. And uh, so what Keynes saw was uh, economic weakness. He saw a great deal of mass poverty, perhaps even starvation in some parts of Europe. He saw kind of a, a, a serious depression and that uh, nobody at uh, the Versailles Conference seemed to be concerned to get together to try to say, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to revive the economy in such a way that it functions not only for capitalists, but at least it provides a minimum standard of living for the mass of the population of uh, Europe? And that uh, otherwise, uh, as Keynes pointed out, uh, the, the mass situation would be one of... Uh, uh, impoverishment, uh, social instability, economic instability, and that this was not, therefore, a good treaty at all. Uh, and Keynes wrote a book along these lines, which was his first major piece of work, which was called The Economic Consequences of the Peace. And what he, in effect, did was to dissect uh, the Versailles uh, Conference and uh, point to all of its shortcomings and point to uh, an alternative. And the one other big shortcoming was the, the uh, insistence of the main participants in the conference that Germany pay for all of the reparations that were needed uh, to cover what had happened in World War in World War One. The reparations were of a huge amount and was going to, were going to be stretched over 30 years. Uh, Keynes thought they were essentially unpayable, asked the question, what happens if they refuse to pay? Do we go in and reinvade Ver Germany or whatever? So he thought this was a very, very bad idea. And in general, uh, what the economic consequences of the peace did was to dissect all these elements in the Versailles Conference in very uh, detailed fashion. But the main message was this, that if you actually deal with Germany by humiliating it and, and actually draining it of any pos economic possibilities, uh, keeping it lost underground, as it were, uh, there will be instability all across Europe and there will be uh, sort of social uprisings and all the rest of it. So what Keynes was kind of predicting, in a way, was the sort of social instability that uh, started to become very apparent almost immediately after the Versailles Conference in 1922 uh, when uh, Hitler... Uh, launched his coup attempt in the, in the Munich Beer Hall, stint, and it was generally laughed at and said this was a kind of a, a very amateurish operation and that therefore didn't go very far, and Hitler got arrested and was actually sentenced to jail for five years but got out after five months. But every, nobody took this seriously, and you can see some certain analogies with you know what's going on in the United States that we... While, while we protest about Trump, uh, we don't really take it seriously. But what, what uh, Hitler learned out of the beer putsch was uh, actually a coup is not a good idea. That the best way is to subvert the electoral process and to use the electoral process to have a legitimate form of power, uh, and uh, which, is, of course, is what happened in 1929, 1933. So, so Keynes was kind of sort of saying uh, humiliation is not a very good idea at all. 
Uh, and uh, interestingly then, uh, when we look at the settlement that came after World War II, we find a completely different approach to, to the situation. Now, whether, uh, now Keynes happened to be the lead uh, British negotiator at the Bretton Woods Conference, which was about the settlement of uh, World War II, and w what degree, to what degree his influence was felt elsewhere, I, I really don't quite know. But nevertheless, uh, the, the settlement of World War II was completely the opposite of what Versailles was about. It was about uh, revitalizing and not humiliating the two defeated powers, that is West Germany as it was then, as it quickly became, and, and of course Japan. And that what you did was instead you used uh, your, your, your surplus product, uh, particularly in the United States, to reestablish uh, the economies of Japan and West Germany in such a way that they reintegrated into uh, the national scheme in a peaceable way and didn't therefore pose a threat. And the amount of instability uh, in, in West Germany and Japan was negligible uh, because the capitalist economies were, were, were going very strong. And by the time you get to the 1980s, uh, the United States found itself in a situation where it had two rival economies which were doing much better than the United States, those of West Germany and Japan. And so if we were in this meeting uh, in the 1980s, we would all be saying, everybody has to be like the West Germany and Japan. They are the ones who are kind of leading capitalist powers. Uh, they've been they've recovered entirely from uh, World War Two. Uh, <clears throat> so the World War II settlement, in fact, uh, did not uh, engage in the humiliation of those defeated and, in fact, uh, uh, sort of approached them uh, with uh, compassion and uh, with uh, uh, a certain amount of empathy and, and, and went out of its way to try to reestablish the basis of a healthy capitalist system. Now, it wasn't really a healthy capitalist system because all of the divisions which had existed in the 1930s in which nationalist interests had been in com com competition were still there. And so the United States, not only did it uh, uh, tolerate the revitalization of the economies of Japan and, and West Germany, but also it set out to reduce tariff barriers and to say that there, there, there is a global exchange and the health of the capitalist economy is about the construction of the world market, which of course is the central proposition of Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto, and that this, uh, this, this world market was going to be actually very much uh, sort of a, a, a support for a very uh, vibrant and, and expansive uh, capitalist economic system. In fact, the capitalist economic system did not expand very much uh, in the post uh, 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 the, the post-Versailles period. In fact, it was rather stagnant in the 1920s and 1930s, in spite of all of the sort of excesses of the upper classes in having, you know, the sort of the, the Berlin cabarets and the nightclubs in New York and all the rest of it. The upper classes were having a ball, as it were, but the rest of the world was 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 really foundering during that period. And what uh, uh, the World War II settlement was about was trying to revitalize in such a way that at least the mass of the population could gain some benefits uh, from an expansive capitalist system that was re-establishing uh, capitalist wealth and power uh, around, around the world on a much more egalitarian basis than was possible in, uh, in, after the Versailles settlement. So this was, if you like, uh, one of the things that was uh, t you know, terribly important. And when you look at it, you, you kind of say, um, Maybe there's a lesson to be learned here, that if you uh, are engaged in, in uh, sort of contestation and competition with uh, other countries and so on, uh, if you win, uh, do you humiliate them in the process or do you actually integrate them? In, and, and it's pretty clear from uh, the evidence of the settlement after World War I and the settlement after World War II that the World War II style settlement which I think probably came from 
serious people re going back and looking at Keynes' uh, analysis in the economic consequences of the peace were kind of saying, well, if we want to establish a regime of peace, which people were talking about in 1945, then the only way to do it is to actually set up an economic system that was actually going to at least uh, ameliorate uh, the, the, the politics of uh, nationalist rivalries on the one hand, and also, of course, the dynamics of class struggle uh, on, on, on the other hand. So this is, if you like, a, a general proposition. But as a general proposition, it has certain applications. And I think those applications are rather, are, are rather useful to, to think about. Uh, for example, right now, uh, we have two wars uh, in, the, in, in the world, uh, which seem to be very, very serious uh, conflagrations. Uh, there is the war uh, with, uh, between Ukraine and Russia, with uh, the United States uh, sort of using Ukraine as a proxy for uh, fight against Russia. <clears throat> and at the same time, uh, there is, of course, the, the uprising of, of Hamas and the response uh, of the Israelis uh, uh, to that uh, in, in, in Gaza. So we have those two conflagrations, and one of the questions I would kind of ask is, to what degree uh, do those conflagrations come out of a politics of humiliation? And to what degree has humiliation played a very important role in, in, in setting the stage, and in fact, in some ways, is the kind of the trigger uh, for uh, these uh, con conflagrations that exist? Well, let us take, first of all, uh, the, the Ukraine conflict. And I've talked about this before, and uh, I th you have to forgive me if I repeat myself, but I think the theme is important enough to be able to sort of re-establish it again. Uh, when Russia, when the Soviet Union collapsed and Russia emerged, uh, what happened to it economically was a disaster, a total disaster. It essentially turned to, the, uh, to, to uh, key economists and to the International Monetary Fund and, and also the Treasury Departments of the, of the major European powers uh, for, for, uh, for advice as to what to do. And the advice was, well, you, you have to go through what's called shock therapy. And the shock therapy was a dismantling of all of the economic relations that existed in the past. And the... Uh, uh, the, the attempt to recreate uh, a, a whole capitalist economy uh, where, where the laws of motion of capital are fully established. Uh, in, in other words, you, you're supposed to sort of uh, drop all of the institutional arrangements that had uh, existed under um, uh, the communist regimes, drop all of those, d d dissolve them all, uh, and, and uh, then at the same time try to imagine you can rebuild a capitalist economy from nothing with no cultural background, no kind of talent and all the rest of it. So Russia went through this terrible, terrible period in which uh, gross domestic product uh, diminished by about, I don't know, 30 or 40 percent. Life expectancy crashed. All the rights of labor disappeared. The rights of women disappeared. Uh, and, and at the same time, uh, there was a kind of a, a triumphalism in the West, which talked about the end of history and the total domination of the world by by uh, neoliberal capital and all the rest of it. So there was a, there was a real attempt, uh, if you like, to kind of hum humiliate the Russians. The Russians uh, lost their currency. The ruble was, had no reliability. And, and at a certain point, uh, it turns out that the main currency in, in Russia between the big corporations was bottles of vodka. People were trading uh, in, in commodities. And uh, there have been situations of this kind, of course, uh, immediately after World War II in Germany. Germany and, 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 and so on. And, and so what you find is uh, uh, Russia in a, in a terrible, terrible state for about three or four years after Glasnost uh, took over and uh, uh, communism effectively ended. And that terrible state was then uh, made even worse by the fact that uh, Russia had been very nervous about, well, OK, what's going to happen in terms of the, the post-Cold uh, War era? And there was a, a, a sort of meeting in Bucharest where an agreement was made that the West would not expand NATO and would not uh, be aggressive with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Russia. But of course, uh, in what, what, what happened in the United States was kind of interesting, that Clinton was in power. 
and Clinton started to talk about a peace dividend uh, and saying, well, we don't, no need to think about uh, uh, all of this warlike stuff and we, don't, we can leave, you know, reduce uh, military, uh, uh, military expenditures uh, and uh, go, you know, start to you know, invest in schools and hospitals and all the rest of it and welfare. Uh, so this, this notion of a peace dividend came along. <clears throat> and immediately, of course, the military-industrial con <laughs> complex folk and all the rest of it started to agitate in Congress and, 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 and so on about you know, the threat uh, that existed and turned uh, Russia into uh, a threat. So by the end of the, the 1990s, uh, Russia was being considered as a threat, uh, even though it really, really wasn't, uh, and uh, therefore military expenditures were, were pushed up. Uh, you got into military Keynesianism uh, and all the rest of it in the 1990s, and, and, and so somehow an opportunity to demilitarize the world was lost. Uh, uh, Clinton, who came in promising, you know, good social welfare and uh, and, and ben you know, benefits in terms of uh, schooling and education and so on, ended up, uh, you know, being a, a good neoliberal and doing all the neoliberal things, and, and 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 NATO started to expand. Now, NATO has always said they are simply a defensive organization, but the Soviet Union was gone. So, what was it defending against? Why was it expanding? And and everybody at that point suddenly realized that NATO was not and never had been a defensive organization. It has always been an offensive one as well as defensive. So it, in effect, it started to be a very offensive and started to expand itself uh, up through the, uh, the, the, the borders of, the, of what had been the Soviet Union. And that, of course, immediately alerted people to the fact that, you know, this, you know, Russia was, again, being humiliated, not only through the economic collapse, but was being humiliated geopolitically. And uh, there was a very important statement made at the end of the 1990s by, uh, by George Kennan. Now, George Kennan had been the architect of Cold War politics in the 1960s and 1970s and something to the 1980s. By the time you get to the 1990s, he's a grand old man of the thing. And so he, but it, here is, here is what he said. And I think it's very important to take him seriously because he was one of the most serious uh, policy makers. Uh, in, in, in the world in the 1960s, 70s and 80s and, and therefore he's worthwhile listening to. And this is what he said about this. And he started to talk about uh, the way in which uh, uh, NATO and the expansion of NATO during the 1990s uh, was in fact threatening to set up um, was the beginnings of, what, uh, of a new Cold War. And this is what he said. He says, I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely and it will affect their policies. I think this is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this whatsoever. No one was threatening anyone anymore. The expansion would, would make the uh, founding fathers of this country turn over in their graves. If there is going to be, um, of course, uh, there is going to be a bad reaction from Russia. And then the NATO expanders will say that we were always told you that that's the way the Russians were, and that is just wrong. So here's Kenan say, saying, uh, the humiliation of Russia is going to have very, very negative consequences. And of course, the negative consequences are all there to see in terms of the Ukrainian invasion, uh, the US response to the Ukrainian invasion, the reestablishment of NATO after uh, Trump had tried to weaken it somewhat uh, that uh, Biden has been concerned with. So here is the situation again where you're going back and if you'd read Keynes on uh, the economic consequences of the peace, you wouldn't have done that. You would have said, OK, let's take the peace dividend. Let's really reestablish things in our own country. Let's build the hospitals and schools and affordable housing and all those things we could start to do by cutting back on the military budget. But no, that was not done. We repeated the, 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 the errors of the Versailles settlement uh, in, in the Russian case. So in the Russian case and that war, you would say that humiliation and the politics of humiliation uh, is in fact very much part and parcel of what is going on. Now, 
At the same time, I could kind of point to another example, one, one I think, which is very, very interesting, which is that Mao, when they got power in 1949, gave a speech. And one of the things he said was, the, the era of insults and humiliation that has guided China's presence in the world for the last hundred years is over and will be over forever. So China is very sensitive about this. Uh, and if you talk with people in China after a bit, they will tell you that the humiliation that existed in, uh, in the sort of late 19th and throughout the 19th, right the way through to the, the communist takeover, the, the humiliation was something that was very, very, very strongly in their psyche and, and affects very much uh, how they are. And, and you remember when the humiliation was about, was about, uh, going back historically, it was about, it was about opium and the Opium Wars. Now, the Opium Wars occurred in sort of 1839 to 1860. Now, in the 18th century, it had been the case that uh, some British traders had found that it was a, a very profitable enterprise, uh, as there always is with, uh, with the drugs, uh, to take opium into China and sell it to the Chinese. And the opium uh, started to be cultivated in India. So there was already a sort of a trade in opium from India uh, to China, which was run by the British merchants, and it was, that was like that for the 18th century. But in the 19th century, there was this massive expansion in, in, in mass production of, of uh, textile goods in Britain, and it need, mass production needed a mass market, and the big mass market for, for that stuff from Manchester was uh, uh, China. But the problem was, well, sorry, India. But the problem was that India didn't have anything to send back, so how did India pay for it? And so the, the idea came to the, some of the British, well, they'd expand the opium trade, and they'd expand it in such a way that they would trade odia, opium for sil silver. So you got a situation where uh, the British were taking opium to China, selling it for silver, the silver came back to India, and then, of course, ended up back in London and in the, and, and, and in the cotton manufacturer's pockets. So this was a system, but for this to happen required that uh, free access be given to the Chinese market for selling opium. And the Chinese tried to stop it and refused. And they closed their market to opium. And the British said, no, no, you're going to have to have an open market for opium. And so they got together with the French and they, 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 they went up the Yangtze and they blew the, apart the Chinese fleet and they established these concessions. Uh, in Shanghai and other places, and the concession in Shanghai was such that a, a large area was taken up with being the, uh, an area where the British could trade under British law. And British, if there was any kind of uh, violence, or if somebody murdered somebody, you would be trade, you would be um, liable to, to British jurisdiction, not Chinese jurisdiction. So this p place was carved out in, in Shanghai. And this became the center of the opium trade. And, and of course, the, uh, the, the opium dens of Shanghai became a feature of uh, lurid fiction in the, uh, even up until the 1920s, 1930s. And, and, and so, so in a sense, in a sense uh, Britain balanced the, the whole kind of budget by forcing China uh, to accept the opium trade. And now there's a certain kind of uh, historical kind of quid pro quo that came. I was very interested. Biden just met with Xi, and what was one of the big, big items that was discussed and con concerned with? Fentanyl. That is, the Chinese are selling fentanyl to the United States in such a quantity, and this is a bit like the opium trade in reverse. But you can see where this is, where, where this is going. But anyway, uh, the point here is that Mao was absolutely sure that imperialism was about, um, you know, uh, this, these sorts of relations being forced down the throats of the Chinese and that the Chinese, uh, China was never, under the Communist Party rule, ever, ever going to submit uh, to anything. So any hint of humiliation uh, in, in, in China politics is met uh, immediately in China with a long historical memory of this. It really does exist. I mean, the few times I was in China, this issue came up. Uh, several times that uh, no China is not going to uh, allow. Uh, it's, uh, so there's a certain suspicion of imperialism and imperialist track, pack, 
practices. So the, the avoidance of humiliation and, and, and the refusal, and, and as soon as there's any sense that hum China is being humiliated, which started to happen with all of this stuff with the, you know, cutting down Huawei and so on, elicits a very, very strong uh, response from the Chinese. So you've got to be very delicate about that, that question. So this brings us to the second uh, case uh, of uh, war uh, in the contemporary period, which uh, is a very, very complicated one. But I just simply want uh, to point out something here. And that is, on one side, you have uh, uh, the Jewish people, and the Jewish people are very, very familiar with the whole history of uh, insults and uh, humiliations. And they have managed to survive those, in fact, in uh, an attempt to eradicate them from the face of the earth was uh, very well resisted. And uh, there is much talk about the importance of that legacy. And I think one of the features that uh, is very strong about it is to say that Israel now is far, far stronger in, defeat, in defense of the Jewish people uh, in, in, in a way as a testimony to its, their capacity to overcome uh, all of the tragedy that exists in their past. But unfortunately, the Israelis, and it seems to me, have not actually recognized one of the features of their own history, which will, supply, will apply to others. And that is that the Palestinians have at the hands of uh, the Jewish state and uh, many Israeli uh, movements amongst settlements and so on, have also been subject to uh, insult and humiliations. And uh, even a warlike attempt to uh, abolish Hezbollah has ended up uh, with Hezbollah being f far, more, far stronger, uh, far more uh, well set up, uh, so that there's now a real fear that Hezbollah will join in the fight. Uh, the, the people who kind of uh, uh, claim to know the ground on this say Hezbollah uh, is in fact a very dangerous military force that almost certainly it would lose uh, to Israel if it uh, actually ventured into the, contact, uh, into the contest but that uh, in invent it would actually inflict very, very great damage upon the Israeli state in so doing. So here is a situation where, again, humiliation and insults and so on don't work. Uh, they, in fact, uh, make your opponent stronger in the long run. And Hezbollah is stronger now than it was 10 years ago when uh, the last fight with uh, uh, the Israelis took place. And this is, in, in a way, the, the sort of tragedy of the, the centuries, that the inability uh, to recognize that uh, the way to handle these issues is not uh, insult and humiliation and attempts to eradicate, but attempts to incorporate, attempts to empathize, uh, and attempts to use compassion to integrate into uh, a situation in which two peoples coming from with very diverse hits, histories and very diverse opinions can actually coexist and work together in common purpose. And this seems to me to be one of the lessons which uh, comes from uh, reading Keynes on the economic consequences uh, of the peace and that we have lived this century uh, and not, re not actually recognized uh, the significance of this dimension uh, to the conflicts which are going on around us.